Um, so thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. So today I want to talk about uh, about a topic which is really a topic of a, math a mathematical problem, mathematical problem which is matrix factorization, which, uh, however, is it's a problem of of inference as I will uh, I will explain it. And um, but I think it has also interesting connections with some problem that may occur in uh, the theory of, uh, of neural networks. And that's why I chose to talk about this topic in front of, uh, of this uh, audience. Um, the, the problem itself, it can be stated relatively easily. Imagine that um, we have a large matrix, which is a product of two factors, y equal a times b. And um, this is y star. Y star is a, is a matrix that has been uh, um, uh, that you would like to, to find and what you have a measurement you have a measurement which is y which is equal to y star plus some noise and here i'm keeping to a simple case where you we just have additive gaussian noise but you might also investigate uh, more general problems in which uh, uh, the noise has different uh, structure and is not uh, only additive it's not only gaussian all these can be, all these are natural and simple generalization. And the question that you ask is, if you measure Y, you, can you reconstruct A and B? So for this, you immediately realize that you need a few qualifications for this problem. First of all, you need to have some knowledge on how A and B have been generated. Uh, for instance, having the sizes of the factors, uh, having some kind of probability distribution of the matrix elements are, are important ingredients. And secondly, there are some obvious symmetries that uh, you will never uh, recover, let's say. Uh, for instance, if you have a, if you permute the right index of the matrix A and the left index of the matrix B, of course, Y is invariant. So when I say, can you recover A and B, uh, it is up to this kind of uh, obvious uh, permutation symmetry of the problem. And um, so you might ask, uh, why, why is this uh, an interesting problem? Well, first of all, you see that it's, it's a natural problem in mathematics. It's a problem in mathematics in which basically you generalize a problem of factorization of, uh, of integers into products. You generalize it to, to matrices. And it also has some very practical motivations. Um, the kind of question that I will want to ask about this problem is uh, uh, if I look at the large size limit, that is a limit of large matrices, uh, is it possible at all to recover the factors knowing some noisy measurement of the matrix? And second, so the first question is a, is a theoretical question, it's a question of formation theory up to what level of noise, up to what size of this noise delta is, is it possible to recover the factors? And the second question is a question of algorithm. Does there, do there exist fast algorithm, let's say polynomial type algorithm that are able to make it? So a first example, uh, a first occurrence in which one can see a, a matrix factorization appearing is the question of dictionary learning. So uh, imagine that uh, I have uh, Y, which is a matrix of R data points, each data point being in an n-dimensional space. So uh, you take your favorite uh, database, let's say, and uh, uh, um, you would like maybe to decompose uh, the vectors of the data points on some basis. And so uh, A, could be a matrix of, of a basis, or in general, it could be an overcomplete basis. So it's a, a set of generating vectors in n dimension. And uh, uh, the, the B would then be the component of the data point vector yr on this vector a mu. This is br mu. So really, what you want to have is for each of the vectors yr star, how can you decompose it? on uh, the basis, the basis vector a mu with some coefficients. 
And often what, uh, what is uh, meant in dictionary learning, dictionary learning addresses this problem in the case in which a mu is a very large basis, it's overcomplete, it has more uh, uh, basis vectors than the dimension of space, and B is sparse, that is, we would like to have the sparsest possible representation of the data on this basis. So if the basis is given, and you, and you have the measurement and you want to find the B, well, that's a simple problem of linear algebra. Um, if you want it to be sparse, it's a very interesting problem in itself called compressed sensing. It's a problem that has been studied a lot in, the, in, in, in information theory in, in the last uh, 15 years or so. It is relatively well uh, understood, an efficient algorithm for doing it. Dictionary learning generalizes this problem in the sense that now what I will have is that I have many data points, that is, I will suppose that R is, ra is rather large, and I want to infer both the coefficients and the basis. I don't know the basis, but I want to find a good basis in which I will be able to have for each data point a sparse representation. So um, a second uh, motivation for uh, uh, looking at this, at this problem of matrix factorization is, uh, is really uh, the, the question of uh, machine learning with uh, with feed forward uh, deep networks. That is so. That is a kind of a of sketch, a cartoon of a, of a deep net in which the information is processed from the input layer to the first hidden layer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At each step, uh, each artificial neuron uh, does uh, the following operation. It does first uh, a, a linear operation. On the signals of the of the net of the of the neuron, the previous layer, and uh, applies some kind of thresholding, some kind of nonlinear uh, uh, function to it. And uh, uh, in machine learning, in the in the training, in the, in the learning phase of uh, of the of, of such a neural network, what we have is that we have uh, the input. We have a database of inputs that could be images and desired output that could be labels like uh, is there a cat or a dog on an image and you would like to find the weights uh, that uh, that are able to uh, implement this mapping from the image to the label so that's the standard setup of machine learning now uh, of course uh, as you know this uh, this problem of machine learning is generally addressed by a simple kind of gradient descent analysis in the space of weights, let's say. You have a, an, an error function, a loss function, it's called, in which for a given value of the W, you measure the er error, that is how many labels you have wrong, and you decrease, you go, you move the W, you move the weights in a direction which decreases this error. So that is a standard approach. I think that there should be another approach which has not been developed yet, and for which really the main, uh, um, the main block, the main important point, uh, which needs to be solved is matrix factorization. Is uh, it is the following that uh, basically you know that if you know the internal representation, for instance, if you know the representation that is here, then computing the weight from the output to here is easy because it could be it's a kind of a, it's called a perceptron problem, and there are very efficient algorithms for doing that. So the problem is that really we need to have the internal representation in order to be able to apply, say, perceptron rule in order to compute the W. And so the big problem that you have in multi-layered network is that at each step, you would like to generate both the weights, but also the internal representation. And so this is typical, you see, of a problem in which you have uh, some uh, output data point and you want to infer for it both the weights and the for internal representation, and then you could iterate this construction. So this is a, a second motivation, let's say, for studying this uh, mathematical problem. But I think that it, with its simplicity, uh, it is obviously a problem of, of a general importance that deserves to be, to be studied. So what I will discuss uh, today Although we have been studying the, the general case of, uh, of uh, uh, matrix factorization with arbitrary dimension, I will dis discuss a slightly simpler case than the general setup that I was showing before. It is a case of symmetric matrix factorization. So it is a case in which the, the matrix that I want to, to find, Y star, 
is the product of a, 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 a n times p matrix x hat times its transpose. So it means that uh, what I have, I have a, my hidden matrix is x hat. It is a n times p matrix. I have the, the I, I build the matrix y star, which is a n times n matrix. And from that, I have a, a noisy measurement of y star. And from this noisy measurement, can I the question is, can I reconstruct the factors x hat? Here, there is a hat missing. Um, this is called matrix factorization. There is another problem which has been studied a lot, which is called matrix denoising. That is, in matrix denoising, the question is, given y, can you reconstruct the signal y star? What is your best guess for the signal? So it is a generalization to a matrix model of uh, the standard denoising that you have for even for a scalar variable in information theory. So what we will work uh, with is a probabilistic setup in which we have some prior knowledge. And the prior knowledge is on the matrix element, the element of the matrix X hat. And we'll suppose that they are IID distributed. They are identically independent uh, di distributed with uh, a probability density function Px. And we will work in the thermodynamic limit, n going to infinity. It means that we have a very large matrix. And there are basically two regimes that have been studied. There is a regime where P is fixed. And you see that P is really the rank of the matrix Y star. So you can have a very large matrix, but it has a fixed rank. Or it can have a rank which is, which is like N to the A, where A is smaller than 1. That is subextensive rank. So this will turn out to be a relatively easy problem. I mean, they have been... Uh, they are not that easy, but at least they have been solved, basically. And there is a big problem, which is the one on which uh, we made recently some progress with, uh, with my former student, uh, Francesco Camilli, which is a problem of extensive rank matrix factorization, in which the rank scales linearly with the size of the problem. So if you look at, at it from the Bayesian point of view, what you have to do is the following. You have a measurement y, which is a noisy version of the product x, x transpose. And from this y, you would like to compute x. Using bias rule, you can look at the probability of the factor, the matrix of factor x given y. You have a prior. The prior is the prior that from which you know that the matrix has been generated. And then you have the likelihood. And the likelihood tells you for each pair of indices ij, basically you have a measurement yij, which is a noisy version of, of the, the, the sum of uh, xi mu, xj mu. And so uh, you have a Gaussian weight if the, if the noise is, is, is Gaussian. And so you have this, this measure. So it is a measure for the matrix x, which is an n times p matrix, given y. So uh, the, the, the problem of matrix factorization is really the problem of generating x, either the most probable value of x or maybe the average of x uh, given y. Uh, a small parenthesis, if you look at denoising, I told you that denoising is really trying what is your best guess for y star. So it has exactly the same measure as the one that I have given here, but uh, when it has one certain uh, aspect which makes it simpler, which is that one studies only observables built from XX transpose. Let me first uh, um, make a small uh, parenthesis on the case of finite rank, and I will start with rank one, so that you understand really what is the, what is the problem and uh, why in the case of rank one it can be solved using uh, some method of statistical physics. So if you have rank one, basically you, you know that your, your planted matrix Y star is a product, Y star IJ is a product XI, XJ, XI hat, XJ hat. And you can look at the probability of X uh, given by the prior and, and, this, uh, and this likelihood. Uh, if you look at this measure, this is so now it is a measure on a N component vector. And this measure, it has, if you look at the energy function, I can expand this term here, and the energy function, and then delta looks, delta is, plays the role of the temperature. 
and they have an energy energy function which is the sum of of uh, three terms. Um, you could look, for instance, in the case in which Px is the easing measure, so uh, x hat as a, a binary variable plus or minus one, and you see that we have. If I look at the at the three terms, I have uh, uh, really um, three. If I expand the product, I have a term which is a sum of zij xi xj, where zij is a noise. So you look at this and you see that is a spin glass energy with a random coupling matrix. There is this term here, which is the attraction towards the planted spin configuration. And there is uh, uh, the last term, which is there, which is just uh, avoiding that the, that the norm becomes too large. So basically, it is like a, a, a spin glass model, but with a strong bias in one direction, which is the direction of x hat. So this can be solved. This can be studied using exactly the phase diagram of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And, uh, and, uh, and one has both. Uh, the theoretical performance is known. Where is the phase diagram? What is the level of delta? What is the level of noise where one can completely recover the vector x hat? And, uh, and there are also good algorithms for doing that. So um, one parenthesis for the experts is that this is an easy spin glass problem in the sense that because I am using bias rule, I am using really uh, the, the measure uh, on x uses the correct prior px of xi. And so technically it means one is on the Nishimori line. So there is no replica symmetry breaking. We are always in a replica symmetric phase. So it is really an easy phase of the of the spin glass problem. It's a ferromagnetic phase of the spin glass problem. So um, both theory and algorithm are, are solved from this, uh, from this uh, uh, point of view. It is an easy problem. This is been extended to the case of finite rank when p is larger than one. p could also scale uh, with n, but uh, not linearly, uh, sublinearly. It has been extended to linear noise channels. It has been extended to asymmetric factors. There are a lot of work on that and efficient algorithms on it. Now, the problem, the, the real problem that, uh, that appears is the problem of extensive rank. What happens? If uh, the number p, which is here, which is uh, the the rank really of the of the of the matrix y star, what happens when this rank grows linearly with the size of the problem? And uh, in that case, uh, the the problem is much harder. There is um, it's it's really a problem mathematically. It's a problem of a matrix model. Uh, it can be tackled by several methods: perturbative expansion. There is a special case of rotational invariant signal which uh, lends itself to, to a nice analysis. And uh, there is this new method that we are proposing, which is called decimation, which I will describe. But first, let me, let me explain you a little bit what, what you can do with the rotational invariant denoiser. Imagine that the factors have been generated x hat from a rotational invariant distribution. Then what you can do is you look at the matrix of measurement, y. In fact, in practice, we look at j, which is y of a square root of n, in order to have the right scaling of the eigenvalue. And one can diagonalize it. Lambda r are the, are the eigenvalues of j, and u r are the eigenvectors. And then, because the measure is rotational invariant, the best denoising that you can do, the best that you can do to recover best approximation of j uh, that you can do is the following. You keep the eigenvectors of the measured matrix. J is a measured matrix, the one that you are given. So you keep its eigenvectors and you rescale the uh, eigenvalues by a nonlinear function, which is known, which really can be, can be computing from the stages transform of the, of the distribution of eigenvalues. It's a bit a sophisticated method, but it is known. It has been shown. It's a method that is due to Boone, Alice, Bouchot, and Potters, and it has been shown to be the best possible uh, denoiser for rotational invariant matrices. Um, so if I summarize the problem, the problem that we have is to understand how to study uh, this measure and how to generate the most probable value of x 
uh, from this measure. The case where p is finite, finite rank is easy. The difficult case is p equal alpha n. And it's only accessible in the very special case of rotational invariance. So the two questions that are that that were that we wanted to to try to answer are the following: Is extensive rank matrix factorization possible? That is, if you have finite alpha, if the rank is is of order alpha n, is it possible that by the, you looking at the measurement y, you can recover some information on the factor? First question. That's a theoretical question. The second question is: Is it possible with a fast algorithm? And uh, um, what we will use is uh, use the prior on the factors. And I will concentrate here, uh, although our, our derivation is much more general than that, I will focus on the case of uh, um, binary factors. That is, I assume that the uh, element of the matrix X hat are plus or minus one. I call them patterns. Uh, like like you have patterns when you study neural networks. So we have binary patterns. They have in, they are input plus or minus one. From these binary factors, what we do is that we construct this matrix, which is xi xi transpose. So um, if I look at the bias optimal measure, uh, it has uh, two uh, aspects. First of all, I know that I am looking for factors which are binary factors. I'm looking for binary patterns. And then I have an energy function, which is an energy function which uh, has the sum of uh, two terms. The first term is a term in which I have uh, my spins, because I know that now that x i mu, they are binary. They are plus or minus 1, so they are spins. These spins interact with j i j, which is a measured interaction matrix. And there is one component, uh, one value of mu. Uh, mu goes from one to p, and p is the rank. So I have really p copies of a spin glass. This is a spin glass energy, but it's not a single spin glass. It's a copy. It's it has p copies of the spin glass, a large number of copies. And these spin glass, they have the j i j, which are uh, the sum of this term here, the uh, the interaction matrix. And this term here, you see, it is a Hebian term. That is, xi hat is, is the planted pattern, is the one that I want to recover. And z is some Gaussian noise. So it's a noisy version of, a Heb, uh, uh, um, uh, of the Heb rule for uh, the, the synaptic connection between i and j. And then there is, uh, um, yeah, one should not confuse, a small remark is that one should not confuse Xi i mu hat, which is really the planted uh, version, which is the one that I want to recover, but I don't know it. I just know the measured j i j. I know the synaptic efficacy, but I don't know which patterns have been planted. And x is really the variable that I am trying to use the measure in order to, uh, in, in the best case, x i mu should be close to xi i mu hat. And then there is a last term, which is here. This term is a kind of repulsion between the copies. You see, I can write it as the sum for uh, pairs of indices mu less than nu of the overlap of the uh, configuration x mu and the configuration x nu square. So this tells me that uh, I should have, for each pair of, uh, of patterns, I should have the smallest possible overlap in order to minimize the energy. So uh, this suggests immediately uh, an interpretation. Uh, uh, you, you see, here I am gradually shifting my, my uh, uh, vocabulary. I mean, it's always the same problem that I've been describing from the beginning, but I'm shifting my, my, my vocabulary using the vocabulary of patterns. I have embedded patterns with a Heb rule and gradually uh, I have uh, peak copies of a spin glass problem, which are uh, embedded in an energy function, which all have the same Heb rule. And I have a repulsion between the copies. So let me just uh, uh, very quickly uh, remind uh, the, the audience of, of the 
simple Hopfield model of associative memory. In the Hopfield model, you have uh, uh, binary spins, SI, which is plus or minus one, and the P patterns are stored with the Hebb rule. So the matrix of coupling JIJ is just uh, XI, XI transpose. And the partition function is the sum of a spin e to the minus beta times the energy. And um, this problem that has been solved in, in all detail, mean field is exact. Uh, the mean field solution is simple for P finite. When P is over the N, when P scales with N, P equal alpha N, which is the extensive rank that I am looking for now, it was solved initially by replicas. It can be solved also by Kevin. And one knows a lot of things. And in particular, one knows something that uh, one can look at uh, the uh, phase diagram. And you see delta is a level of noise. It plays the role of the temperature. Alpha is the number of patterns per neurons. And one knows this, uh, this phase diagram is very well known. Below the red line, we have a retrieval phase in which we have retrieval states very close to each of the patterns. The patterns close to each of the stored patterns that are from which the, the J has been constructed, there is a retrieval state. And uh, the re these retrieval states are the minima of the energy. And there are metastable states also, but uh, uh, in all the red phase here, we have retrieval in the sense that we have a very good correlation between the minima of the energy and the stored pattern. If you are in the below the, the dashed line here in the blue phase, uh, we have also retrieval states which are close to the patterns, but they are not necessarily the ground states now. And actually, they are uh, uh, lower lying states, so they are metastable states. So let me look back at my problem of matrix factorization with this new vocabulary. Again, I'm just using, uh, the, I'm looking at the general case, but uh, in, the, in the case in which really the matrix elements are binary in order to simplify things. But I'm using a, a new vocabulary, which is the one of, of neural networks, uh, memory neural networks. And so if I go back to my energy function, my energy function has two terms. This term here, it looks like a Hopfield model, except that I have copied it several times. Instead of having one set of spin xi, I have p sets of spins xi mu. And then these p steps of spin, I, I, I know, so each of them is in the landscape of the Hopfield model, this landscape defined by the j. So in particular, if I am at, uh, at uh, in the red phase, in the retrieval phase, I know that I have retrieval states close to each of the stored patterns. And now what we, I will have is that each of the xi mu, uh, if I go, if I look for a ground state, each of them should go to one of these retrieval states. But then on top of it, what they happen is that they repel each other. So what they should do is try to go, each of them, in a distinct retrieval state. If I succeed in doing that, I have exactly p retrieval state, and I have p copies of the Hopfield model. So I should get back one x which is each x would be a retrieval state close, close to a pattern. And that, that would be the solution for my matrix reconstruction. Um, unfortunately, if one tries to do that, for instance, numerically, this is a very complicated problem because there is, there is a, the trade-off of, uh, of the Hopfield landscape, which is here, and the repulsion between these copies, which makes it quite complicated. And so, uh, um, what what we propose is to do it rather in uh, in a sequential mode. In a sequential mode is the following. I, I will, uh, for the sake of the presentation, I will assume that I have an oracle. The oracle is an algorithm that, given j, finds one of the retrieval state, which are the attractors of low energy. Uh, so if I if I am given a certain matrix j and I am in the good phase where retrieval is possible. I assume that I am able, given j, to find one of the retrieval states, this one or this one or that one. And so what I will do is the following. Given j, I use this oracle to find one retrieval state, eta 1. Eta 1 will be close to one of the patterns, let's say xi mu, xi at mu 1. And then what we will do is that we will construct a new coupling matrix by subtracting this pattern. 
That is, we had the J, which was a measured matrix, and we go from J to J prime, which is J minus the straw, the, 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 the eta, eta transpose of the pattern that has been retrieved. And from this J prime, we use the oracle again and we iterate and we, and we try to find eta two. So what you see is that uh, basically, sorry, if, if I have found, imagine that with the oracle, I have found this retrieval state. So I have this eta, which is here. What I will do is by subtracting the uh, subtracting this term, I will basically erase this attraction basin. I will erase this minimum, and I will remain with the landscape in which this retrieval state has been uh, washed out. And so, uh, in the next step, I will try to find another one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so that is the process of of decimation. Uh, subsequent decimation steps will find different patterns. And after P steps of decimation, we list the, uh, the best minima that we have found at each step, eta one up to eta P. And this is our, our approximation for the, for the list of the factors of the matrix. So um, the, the, what is the quality? What is the error which is made when one does that? Well, the error that is made is measured by the overlap the overlap is the dot product of the retrieved state, eta1, with the stored pattern, the corresponding stored pattern, psi hat mu1. This is the overlap. If m1 is very close to 1, remember that these are binary vectors. If m1 is very close to 1, then one has uh, uh, found eta, which is very close to one of the stored patterns. What we know is that at the first step, we know the value of M1. It was computed by Amit Gutfreund and Sopolinsky in their analysis of the Hopkill model. It is typically very, very large. It depends, of course, on, on alpha, but uh, it will be typically of the order of 0 0.97, 0 0.98. It depends on, on what alpha you are looking at. So what will happen then is that at the next step of the decimation, you have a modified optimum model in which you start from the matrix J0, you subtract something. This something is not one of the stored pattern, but it is a noisy version of the stored pattern. And, uh, and uh, uh, from that, you want to see what you will get uh, in terms of the, of the minima. You will find a new retrieval state. It will have an overlap, which is M2 to the pattern mu2. And we have to compute M2 in order to see if the uh, if the, how, how it degrades, how the, the quality of the retrieval dis degrades. After k decimation steps, we have a coupling matrix, the Hebian matrix, which is the J0, the usual xi xi transpose, minus the subtraction of k terms. And each of these k terms is correlated with one of the patterns. So it's a new Hopfield-like model with a modified coupling matrix. This modified matrix it can be written this way here are all the patterns that have not been yet not been found yet and here are the k patterns that have been found quotation marks that is one has found for each of the mu r one has found an approximation eta r which was quite close to it but not exactly equal to it and this is my new j so you see that in this new j what i have here is i have a signal term that's a hebian term it's a kind of signal term that will polarize, tend to polarize the spins toward the patterns that have not been seen yet. So it's a single P minus K pattern store. So you see that along decimation, this signal is becomes stronger because we know that there is a phenomenon of interference. If we have more patterns that are memorized, then uh, it is, uh, um, uh, there is interference between these patterns. Here, the number of, of patterns that you have to, to, to find decreases with the decimation, so you will have a better signal. It will be less noisy. But each time you have an approximation in, uh, in one of the patterns you have found, you add extra noise. And so, and finally, there is a Gaussian noise. So you have the three sources of noise. This one is like the temperature, is a Gaussian noise. It's here from the beginning. This one tells me that with decimation, I should have a stronger signal to noise ratio, but this one adds an extra noise. And so the big problem that we had to solve was really to uh, understand, uh, to do the statistical physics of this modified Hopfield model in order to see really, is it when you do decimation, 
is the uh, decrease of noise due to interference here, is it stronger or, or weaker than the increase of noise due to the fact that we did imperfect, uh, uh, imperfect identification of the patterns in the first decimation steps. And so for this, what we need to do is to compute at each step of the decimation, what is the quality of the retrieval. And MK plus one can be computed from the knowledge of M1 up to MK using replicas and cavity analysis. This, I will not explain the techniques. It is something which is a kind of standard. It's um, kind of, um, in that case, a bit uh, sophisticated, but it's, it, it, it is something that we have done. And here's really the quality of uh, what is obtained. So the red curve is, uh, is a theoretical prediction. The theoretical prediction, that's as function of t. t is really uh, k divided by, uh, should be k divided by p. It is a fraction of the patterns that have been found. And you see that we start, that is a case where alpha equal 0.03, the noise is 0.08, and uh, the, 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 the decimation, the theory tells us that initially we have uh, an error which is an overlap which is very close to one. It's just an error of three in, in 1,000 uh, of overlap 0.997. And then when we do the decimation, what we find is that the overlap increases. So it means that really the effect of the, the, the major effect is a decrease of noise due to the fact that we have less pattern. We have started to decimate. And, and the increase of noise due to the poor quality of the retrieval is not a big, uh, is not a big problem. So it means the quality of decimation increases with the decimation. And so, and so this shows that decimation is a valid process because you see, and, and basically the performance of the algorithm will be decided by the phase diagram that we have, the original phase diagram, let's say, because then once we start decimating, then the problem becomes easier. Um, the, the blue points are experimental results that we have with a simulated annealing-based uh, decimation. So, uh, in fact, what we have been using in order to do the, 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 the numerical study is just a simulated annealing. We, we run a simulated annealing algorithm, and uh, uh, the, we use an oracle, an oracle which is the following. Uh, we, we run the simulated annealing, we find a configuration. If this configuration has an, a ground state as, a, as an energy which is close to the theoretical ground state energy that we know, it is between E ground state and lambda E ground state, then we keep it and we accept it as, as, a, as a retrieval state. If it is not in this band here, it means that it is a metastable state and we restart. And, uh, and we iterate that many times and we can uh, look at uh, 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 the number of uh, restarts that we have to do in order to find the full decimation. And this is a function of n. So this is a simulated annealing with restarts. This is a log of the number of restarts versus n. And what you see, you see two effects. You see the fact that it is exponential. So our oracle is not a polynomial algorithm. It's an exponential algorithm. It's an, it's an algorithm that goes exponentially with the size of the, of the system. But still, it has one nice uh, um, advantage, which is that still it works reasonably well for sizes n of the order of one or two, even 2,000, we can do relatively easily on the laptop. So it means that, it, yes, it is exponential, but with a relatively small prefactor. And so sizes of a few thousands are, 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 are possible. So one thing that we did is to compute now the mean square error. The mean square error is the measure of the quality of the retrieval that we did. So we look at the J that we obtained from decimation and compare it to the original one. And uh, these are, uh, this is the one that we obtained from uh, the uh, uh, decimation, let's say the blue and the green are two variants of the decimation. And uh, uh, the red dots are uh, the numerical experiments. And as a comparison, we, we wrote here the mean square error that is predicted from the rotational invariant denoiser that I had pro provided be before. Um, so you see that there are two orders of magnitude of, of gain of, 
of, of, of uh, signal and so it's it's a much better result of course it uses much more information because we are in a case in which the matrix element of the factors are binary they are not at all rotational invariant and so the use of the prior that they are binary is what allows us to make this big gain in the in the area so uh, we have generalized that to cases in which the patterns are diluted they could be zero plus or minus one and they can take the value zero with a probability uh, uh, one minus rho and plus or minus one with a probability rho uh, this is a phase diagram so the red and blue lines are the one of the standard Hopfield model and this one is when rho equal 0.05 and you see that the threshold in particular alpha uh, goes much uh, much larger in the case in which you are diluted so you can go to ranks which are really sizable this is this goes up to rank close to one half of the size of the of the matrix and again we find the same result that we have uh, the decimation uh, has a much better performance than a rotational invariant denoid uh, the the approach of decimation has been generalized. We have generalized it to arbitrary measure with the, in the symmetric case, generalized it to the case in which it is asymmetric. Um, this is uh, interesting for dictionary learning. And uh, uh, so I think that it is a, a viable approach to the, to the problem. Um, basically, we have obtained two interesting results. First of all, we find that if the noise is small enough, there is a finite regime of noise, delta less than a certain threshold value. There is a phase diagram in which the global minimum of the energy are the peer retrieval states close to each pattern, and decimation is, in principle, able to find them. Uh, decimation is able to find them provided that you have a good oracle algorithm. So what is a good algor or oracle algorithm? A good oracle algorithm is an algorithm that, given the set of Jij, the, the, the coupling matrix of the HEP type, Jij equal Xi Xi transpose, are you able to reconstruct one of the factors, Xi, Xi mu, let's say. And this is an oracle algorithm. So this is not easy. We have seen that simulated annealing is able to do it, but only with exponential time. So I think that it is a very interesting challenge. It is also a, a challenge uh, uh, which is interesting in, in the sense uh, that uh, it is also a kind of question that one may ask if one is interested in uh, reconstructing possible patterns of neural activity from the uh, measurement of synapses. Imagine that uh, you do, uh, as, as, as is being done now, a, a careful measurement of the connections between the neuron in a sizable uh, um, uh, slice containing enough neurons, and you have access both to the connection, what neuron has synapse with another one, and also maybe hopefully to the sign of the synapse, let's say, excitatory or inhibitory. If you have that, you have my matrix JIJ, let's say, maybe with some noise, certainly with some noise of measurement. Um, it would be interesting to be able to, to, to decompose it into xi xi transpose in order to see what could be the natural patterns of activity that you can, that you can, uh, that you can get. So this is exactly what, uh, uh, what we are trying to do with this matrix factorization. Uh, decimation needs an oracle algorithm. It, simple minded energy descent works fine for n less than 2000, but it is exponential. So, a bit more of effort are, are needed for that. But at least I think that we have found a route which makes a connection between um, the, the, prob the mathematical problem of matrix factorization and what we know about the energy landscape of memory networks. And that uh, progress in one of the two fields will be quite uh, fruitful for, for the other one. 